Good morning to everyone. It is great to see all those that have come out to be with us today. It's great to have everyone online with us and praying everybody is staying healthy and praying that everybody is doing well. Isn't it wonderful to be together? Isn't it wonderful to be able to worship our God? And let's make sure we do everything we can to keep our hearts and our minds focused on God this morning. As we begin our services, I want to go through those that are struggling with sickness and those that, that need our care and our love. First of all, Cheryl Fulkerson, we want to continue to remember Cheryl and her prayers as she's struggling with COVID-19. Let's continue to remember Tony Tanner and Karen Tanner in our prayers. Sybil Angel has gone home. We're thankful for that. Uh, family also expressed their appreciation for all the prayers that have been going on her behalf. And let's also continue to remember Corrine Hall. And we've got a lot of folks, families, and friends that we need to remember. Lainey Hill, that's Joni Schulteis' relative, uh, is struggling with COVID-19 and pneumonia. Arlene Willis, that's Wayne Trailer's sister, is having surgery. We need to remember her. Trudy, folks, we just need to keep Trudy in our prayers. She is just, her family, and she is struggling. Uh, Renee Baxter and Troy Baxter, relatives of hers, both have COVID as well as uh, pneumonia. Uh, Jim Pringle, which is her brother-in-law, was admitted into the hospital this last week, suffering with pneumonia and COVID-19. I'll mention two others in her family in just a moment, but folks that we need to just keep Trudy in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, Carol Bonaleri, that is Valley Cox's sister-in-law, is in critical condition. She's asked us to remember her, uh, Joe Mo Marquart, that is Cheryl Holland's friend, has broken his leg. Joy Aldridge, that's Herbert Mary Lee Harper's daughter. Uh, they've asked us to remember her in our prayers. James Davis, his English teacher in school, Mr. Uh, Ray, has got cancer, and James asked us to remember him. Brad Davey, that's King, uh, Randy King's brother-in-law, is undergoing some tests uh, and health tests and so forth right now. Continue to remember Gabrielle Eubanks that she's been suffering with COVID and a friend of hers, Shelby Faith, that's been struggling with COVID as well. And then the Miller family, uh, Steve Miller and, and Stephanie have asked us to remember, first of all, Steve's mother, Pat, who fell last week. She has spent a few days in the hospital, but she's home now, and they appreciate our prayers. Also remember some good friends of theirs, uh, Brent Kramer, as well as uh, Carl Schultes, and keep those individuals in your thoughts and prayers as well. Then we have Julie Niederhaus has a co-worker that she's asked us to remember her family. Her co-worker has a 16-year-old daughter, Allison Hale, who's struggling with cancer, so we definitely want to remember them in our prayers as well. Now, folks, to those that uh, we want to give our sympathy to, first of all, the family of Justin Warthrop that is Trudy Harris's relative passed away with COVID, and that took place on Thursday. And then Trudy's brother-in-law, Clay Young, passed away, I believe that was yesterday, with COVID. So let's keep, again, Trudy and all her family in our thoughts and in our prayers. Continue to remember the Coleman family. Lenny's uh, aunt passed away with COVID, Laura Hampton. Let's, many of you might remember several years ago, a uh, young lady at that time, Shelly Decker, uh, that was attending here at Washington Avenue. She passed away this last week, and we want to remember the Decker family in our prayers. And then also the Martin family, that's Wayne Trailer's sister, Darlene, that passed away this last week. And I think funeral services were on Tuesday. So a lot of people struggling, a lot of people uh, that we need to give our love and sympathy to because of loss of loved ones. And let's make sure we do that as we pray this morning, as we worship our God, just remember all these families and ask God's blessing for each and every one of them. Today, our services, Rodney's going to be leading us in our singing. Danny's going to lead us in prayer. Mark Shiflett is, is uh, leading the communion today. Uh, Kyle Kemp will be reading our scripture. And of course, David will be presenting the lesson to us. I want to remind everyone here as well as online, for those that are all online, special announcements going to be at the end of our services today. 
uh, refer, uh, relating to a guy that has come to look at our, our uh, job opening, uh, our minister's opening. So I encourage you to stay, uh, be a part of that. He's just going to introduce himself, but we want to be able to give Josh some time to do that. So that's going to take place at the end of our services, so be ready for that. Rodney? All right, once again, good morning, Washington Avenue Church of Christ. And once again, we're so happy that if you're following on live stream as we sing praises to our God. The first song of the day will be, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. And if you will, let's go ahead and sing together. <clears throat> Not stand. <laughs> I'm going to give you all a, a, a get out of jail free card this morning, so you're safe. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, some from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Bring him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord. The song before the prayer will be in Christ alone. <clears throat> we'll sing that together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fierce drought, and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the Body lay, my 
lighter the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands for victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. For life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you. And Father, we trust you so much with our lives. Father, we have so much to be thankful for. For most we have, we can give thanks for your son Jesus who died on the cross for us. Father, we know that many face of and have faced the loss of loved ones. And Father, we just rejoice for those in Christ and for the hope that we can have in Christ and the wonderful plan that's been given to us by you through your Son. Father, we know when hearts are heavy that we can come to you, that we can find grace to help in our time of need that we have precious memories. For most, Father, we have your word that gives and brings comfort to us. And now, Father, as your people, we pray that we will rejoice, that we will not be ashamed of the gospel, that we will not compromise your word, that we will not fear the wicked, that we will stand strong and never be ashamed of you or your word of your wonderful gospel, that we'll love one another as you have loved us. That, Father, that as we come together today, as your word is broken, as it's open, that it may be received by us with sincere listening and sincere hearts. Father, we have so many opportunities. We have so many blessings. And it seems, Father, that when barriers come along, when challenges like this COVID-19, other challenges that they can be overcome, or we will have ways to still continue to reach out your word. Father, we pray for our leaders of our nation. Father, we pray for peace. Father, we pray that we'll continue to have freedom to preach the gospel freely. And Father, we pray for those who are in other places that do not have the freedoms that we have, that we'll be bold and not ashamed of your word, that we'll stand for that which is true and right. And Father, we pray that we'll stand in, against evil men who teach things wrong and not f follow their ways in the ways of the world. Father, we pray that we'll exhibit, most of all, thanksgiving to you and we'll demonstrate love to one another. We pray for your scripture. It's the one that reads the scripture today. We pray for the one that breaks the word of God and that you'll be with him and that we will listen to the word and we will be inspired 
and we'll be in challenge. And Father, we pray for the missionaries all over the world. We'll pray, Father, for those who are suffering because of this disease and many that are lonely and, and many that are tired. And Father, let us not grow tired, not, let us not grow weary, not grow weary in well-doing. Oh, Father, we love you so much. Be with us and let us rejoice and be glad because we've come together to this house of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The song before communion that we're letting will be uh, on PowerPoint, Jesus' name above all names, and then our invitation song will be, I've decided to follow Jesus after the sermon today. Jesus' name above all names. Jesus, name above all names, wonderful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer. come to that part of our worship service where we have the opportunity to join together in communion. Of course, this is a time that we follow the example that was set by Jesus and the apostles with the Last Supper. And I've given a lot of thought to the apostles this week about these men, and particularly how different they were. And I think about some of the men that, that, that served as the apostles, that participated in this Last Supper. You had people like Matthew, the tax collector, who was the, the representation of the Roman Empire. He was the face, for many, of Rome. He represented the establishment. He represented the power of Rome. And then you had an apostle named Simon the Zealot, and when we think about a zealot, right, someone who is fervishly uh, behind some particular cause or, or idea, at that particular time, most people believed that Simon the zealot meant that he was opposed to Rome and that he was so strong in his beliefs that the name zealot was actually attached to him. So you had two men from complete opposite political perspectives on Jewish life in, in Israel at that time being selected by Jesus to be together. I've always wondered what kind of conversations they may have had during their time with Jesus. We also know that these individuals had different agendas, right? We remember the, the, the example of when James and John's mother said, Jesus, hey, I, I want you to, to put the, my sons you know, in the premier positions in your kingdom, right? Trying to set up some side deals here. Even in the account, in, in Luke's account, of the Last Supper. It says that the disciples were still arguing amongst themselves who was the greatest. And so Jesus is bringing these people together, different beliefs, different views, different agendas. And we see that he will mold them into this particular group that would spread the gospel, that would be a united group moving forward. And I think it's interesting this particular time that they're together at the Lord's Supper. You know, one of the things I don't think we appreciate as much in our culture is just the, the, the importance that is placed in being with someone and having a meal with them or eating together. In fact, even today in some cultures, it's not really considered uh, uh, that you have established a relationship with someone until you've eaten with them. 
And Jesus uses this opportunity, this special time together, to focus their hearts and their minds when he says, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus becomes the focus. So this morning, as we are together, as we are partaking of this Lord's Supper, and all the ways that the world tries to categorize us, whether it's culturally, racially, politically, economically, you name it, all of that is meaningless right now. Because every single one of us has one key thing we have in common. We need Jesus. We need Jesus' blood, and our hope rests upon that blood that was sacrificed on the cross for us. So this morning, as we have this special time together, as we are able to experience each Lord's day, let's put everything else aside about what makes us different and think about what brings us together. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we now have this opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, I ask that you bow with me as we give thanks for this bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so blessed to be here this morning. Father, we are so fortunate that as we look at this world, and Father, as we look at the things that try to distract us and, and pull us apart, Father, that we can focus our attention on Jesus. Father, that each and every one of us can see where we are all together in terms of our relationship with you, in our need for the cleansing blood of your Son. And Father, I pray that as we now partake of this bread, which represents his body, that body that was broken on the cross for us, Father, it will help us to be stronger and more united in that knowledge and that understanding. And Father, that will be demonstrated in the way that we love one another as your Son loved us. And I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We bow with me and let's give thanks now for this fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, again, as we come to you in prayer, Father, as we have this time to focus on your son, Jesus, Father, we now have the opportunity to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, the precious blood that we rely upon for the forgiveness of our sins, the blood that helps us recognize how each and every one of us are the same in this fundamental way that we need that precious blood. Father, again, I pray that as we have this time of reflection, Father, that we can turn it into motivation and we can turn it into action as we go out into this world. And again, have the opportunity to shed your light to this lost and dark world. And I offer this prayer again in the name of Jesus, amen.
As we come to the conclusion now of the Lord's Supper, we take this moment in our service to consider and think about the opportunity we have to give back to the Lord. And of course, uh, for those of you that are here in the auditorium, uh, as our service is concludes. If you would like to leave a contribution in the box uh, near the exit, you may do so. But of course, this is a time also as we give. It's not just the physical act of giving, but it's time again for self-reflection. And I pray at this time as we go to our Father in prayer that we consider again the blessings that we have and how that motivates us and how we give. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we come before you in prayer, again, acknowledging the blessings of this life and acknowledging the blessings that come after this life. And Father, again, as we look to ways in which we can be of service, Father, we know that we can give in many different ways. But Father, we know there's a special way that we can give of our means to further the work of your church. Father, I pray as we begin this new year, a year, again, still filled with many uncertainties, but a year, again, where there's a sense of hope. Father, I pray that you will guide us in the decisions that we make to use the resources that we have wisely, but again, with confidence and with compassion as we try to further your word. And Father, as always, we thank you for the greatest blessing of all, and that is through your son, Jesus Christ. And we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. The scripture reading will be from Isaiah 61, the first and second verse. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of visions of our God to comfort all that mourn. Good morning, church. I hope you're doing well today. And those of you that are online, I hope you're doing especially well uh, today as well, because today is a day that we are able to come together, uh, whether digitally, virtually, or here in person, we get to celebrate uh, our God together. We get to praise and worship, and that's always a blessing. Did you have a good week? Did you get some things done? Was it pretty rough? I had to be in the office at 6 a.m. one day this week. That's suffering. <laughs> Not really. It wasn't too bad. It's for good things. Good things are happening uh, in our congregation, and there's some good things that are happening in the world. I'll be fair, there's some terrible things as well, but you know what? We press on, and we celebrate. And with that in mind, I want to read this for you. <clears throat> there's a party going on right here, a celebration to last throughout the years. So bring your good times and your laughter too, we're gonna celebrate your party with you. Come on now. I knew you would do it. I knew you would do it. That song came out in 1980, Cool in the Gang. I remember hearing that song as a kid and I don't know what happened, but it just comes over you. Six years old and I'm like, yeah, celebrate. I don't know what, but I'm gonna get into it, right? There are things that we have to celebrate and be excited about. Chris Tapp did a post recently in which he talked about listening to music and how it comes over you and you have this physical reaction that comes to it. Those of you that love music, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But even if it's not music, those of you that really love sports, have you ever just stood up and threw your food and cheered because something took place? Probably. There's different things that we get excited about and celebrate. You hit a shot you can't believe you hit. You're playing a game, you roll the dice, your character does something you couldn't imagine. You're up and you're, you're celebrating that moment. There's reasons that things take place in life that we must get excited about. So what about celebrating in the presence of Jesus? The single most important person who's ever walked this earth, celebrating in the presence of Jesus. Here's some things we're celebrating this past week. 
Janie Walker, gymnast extraordinaire, had a competition yesterday, fifth place overall, second place uh, on the bars, the Pellar bars. And there were some incredible people uh, that she had to compete against and which she crushed them. Let us celebrate her victory of that. It's no small thing. Another reason to celebrate is I had a friend that posted on Facebook, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. My whole family is free. We're out of quarantine. There's a reason to celebrate. I was excited this week because in playing a game, I got training from one of the greatest game masters of all time. Evelyn came and sat next to me and was showing me how to properly play a game. It's a small thing, but man, what a reason to celebrate that a small child would come and be so joyous in a moment. These are things that are not entirely separate from Christianity, especially in the lives of Christians. As we spend time talking about the presence of Jesus and we've spent time talking about the challenging presence of Jesus and we talk about um, the, the, the magnitude of the presence of Jesus, today I need for us to talk about celebration and the presence of Jesus. It's biblical. It's truly biblical. Let's go back in time a little bit and talk about one of these great moments in the history of God's people. The, the Israelites, they had found themselves in Egypt. Now, this would be a moment that would resonate with them throughout centuries and centuries. Their people would sing about this. They would talk about this. They would repeat the story because what God had done in his saving works had hit them so deeply that how could you not celebrate that particular moment? And it goes all the way back before the time in Egypt to when God made a promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, if you want to read that with me, just to refresh yourself, or if you haven't read it before, why don't you open your Bibles, if you have one with you, and read along for just a second. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Of course, you know the story of Abram and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's children and how Joseph ended up because of God's blessings, even in the midst of horrible, horrible circumstances and how he was treated so poorly by his family, God allowed him to elevate to prominence in Egypt. And their numbers continued to grow and grow and grow. And over time, there was a Pharaoh who saw them not as a blessing to the land, but as a problem. And so he oppressed them and he enslaved them and they suffered. They suffered immensely. But God, who was always faithful to his promises, heard their oppression. And he sent Moses and Aaron and he said, I'm going to take action. And through Moses and Aaron, he would have the people be led out of Egypt. For sure, God would use his power, his immense saving power to perform these incredible plagues to demonstrate that he is God of all, he is the Almighty, that no force can put him under subjugation, but yet he is supreme. And he gave them 10 opportunities to listen to him. But on the 10th, the Egyptians said, get out. And so the Israelites rose up and they gathered their things and they had participated in the first Passover that 10th plague, and they left and they took the, the gold and the items from the Egyptians and they come to the Red Sea and says, God says, I'm faithful. And he parts the Red Sea and allows them to pass through. And the waters come down and defeats the enemies, the ones that would oppress them. And on the other side, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, they celebrated with song and with dance. And then they would proceed through the Sinai wilderness until they come to Mount Sinai. And if there was ever a moment to celebrate, this is it, isn't it? Because God is coming down in this presentation of his presence in which there was thundering and there was lightning and there was fire and the earth would tremble at his voice. This was God in his presence with his people. How could you not celebrate that moment? And beyond that, it wasn't just God in a presence. It was God being active in his presence and establishing a relationship, a covenant. In Exodus chapter 19, we read of this, and he says that he would be their God if they would be his people, and they would be a very special people to him if they would be faithful and keep his covenant. 
And it would be through their lineage, particularly the lineage of David, King David, that a Messiah would come, the Christ would come, and this would be reason to celebrate because the earth would go through a transformation that would affect them so, so deeply, unlike any other of the salvation works of God that occurred before. And yet, with so much promise, with so much evidence, with so much action on God, they didn't stay so faithful. This is a Lamassu, which is a particular spiritual figure in the Assyrians and the Babylonian cultures. And I put this up here because... They got led astray. God's people, the descendants of Abraham, they got caught up in pagan worship, other gods, other concepts, and they latched onto it. And, and you know, God, he was sending them messages and was, please don't do this because I love you so much. You're my people. You should be celebrating that relationship. And yet they would turn away from that and attach themselves to other concerns, the nations around them. And he would send messengers, giving them warnings, telling them the consequences, and they wouldn't listen. And so even though they had this moment to celebrate the exodus, the great exodus where God delivered them, they descended and they descended. And there would be peaks and they would descend and peaks and they would descend. And not all of them would give up, but they would come to these moments of utter shame and brokenness. Absolute utter shame and brokenness. After about 900 years, in about the year 586, the Babylonians would come in and destroy Jerusalem. Their daily life shuddered. Their identity of who they were as God's people in that nation, in that kingdom, who should have been lifting up, being shining lights for God, shuddered. The nations were no longer talking about God's faithfulness to them, but how they had turned and rejected their God, and that the connection they had with God shuddered as they were led away in shame and brokenness and captivity because they chose to not celebrate God, but to turn away from God, to take Him for granted, and to chase after things that were other than God. And yet, God didn't forgive, forget them. God didn't give up on them. He would send the prophets and they would have these messages. All right. Now, Isaiah chapter 35 is one of these particular messages. It's so amazing because it has a near uh, future application for them because this would have been right before King Hezekiah would have been first under siege by the Assyrians and, and would have a distant application for them. And we see Jesus reference back to these. In Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4, 5, and 6, well, actually, if we go over to verse 3, he's talking about strengthening the hands and firming up the knees in a particular kind of strength. And then he brings up this idea. He says, say to those who are fearful, who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for the water shall burst forth in the wilderness, in the stream, in the desert. God's saying there's an action that he's going to take. Don't get weary. Don't fall down. This isn't some just vague, um, shallow optimism for the sake of optimism he's given. This is a reality that God will take action and that our lives should celebrate that, respond to that, and lean into it. In the last part of Isaiah, he gives another one as well, a little bit later in the future. And this is an anticipation, of course, of the Messiah. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Do you hear hope in that? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, yes, to proclaim liberty to the captives, yes, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, absolutely, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. How could you not be willing to celebrate that God will take action and that God is going to move, move on the earth to draw his people close to them, even though They're in a shameful position, even though they are broken in a way they should not be. But 
It's their choices that led them there. And it's God's grace and love and care that offers his hand to pull them up. Now, the beauty of this is, is it allows us to move to Jesus. I wanted to start with that so we can have a context for the the Hebrew people at the time of Jesus. The Exodus was still of great significance to them as they still celebrated the Passover. They would still sing the songs and, and mention God in the prayers and memory of the Exodus, that God would have these saving works. At the same time, they were anticipating the Messiah who would lead them to a greater life, a transformation and cause for celebrate celebration they were poised for that for sure and jesus jesus had come to deliver this is the message he would give to them if you turn over to luke chapter 7 you can see that john the baptist had these disciples and john was uh, locked up at the time uh, his preaching and teaching uh, for the coming of the kingdom of god elevated uh, the attention that was to point towards Jesus. At the same time, he would not tolerate sinful sinful behavior, and he was willing to call out people, even kings, uh, for their illicit relationships. But while he was locked up, there was a moment when he sent his disciples, and they asked Jesus, are you him? Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God we should be looking for? And Jesus Uh, would respond to them in Luke chapter 7. And he said to them, uh, did I put the wrong one? That's crazy. So he would say to them the repetition of Isaiah chapter 35, in which he would point out to them that he was actually the one who would be bringing the comfort and he would be lifting the people up and he would be fulfilling all the things that Isaiah had said. He said, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. If you go back to Luke chapter 4, this is a passage we hit just a few weeks ago, but the significance of it is Jesus is making a proclamation that he is the Son of God, he has come, and the time is at hand. He's going to reference back to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and he would do it in a way and say, I am the anointed, I'm here, I'm here. And if you look at that passage, he's quoting exactly from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. He's announcing the proclamation. And if it's a proclamation, shouldn't it be celebrated, especially when it's of such significance? Now, the question that we have to ask and that they must have asked back then is, what does this look like? Because when they saw Jesus, it wasn't fitting a vision that they had for what this messianic prophet, priest, and king might should look like. If he was going to be a strong military leader, he didn't look big and imposing. This wasn't a Dwayne Johnson figure who was six foot seven and uh, hundreds of pounds and muscular and could defeat anybody in combat. It's a carpenter's son. It's this guy Jesus that looks like anybody else. He didn't appear to be of any special political um, affiliation or mindset or connected in any way that seemed to matter. It's, it's that guy from Nazareth, Galilean sort of figure. He didn't even come in when we move later on as he's going into Jerusalem. It still must have been confusing. What is this supposed to look like? Because instead of being covered in uh, regal clothing and, and uh, the most amazing shiny crown on his head, he came into Jerusalem on a donkey not even a noble steed like a great powerful uh, arabian horse nothing of the sort a donkey people would have wrestled with this because it's not really fulfilling what they think it ought to look like and even still this is jesus transforming the way that people need to conceive this in truth maybe you don't look for the muscle-bound guy maybe you shouldn't be impressed with the fancy clothes Maybe you shouldn't be impressed with the great military strategies or the political connections or any of that. How about you really get excited by the actual true power that is found in the Son of God? How about you get excited and celebrate because he's able to transform your life on several levels? Jesus affected the daily life of the people 
Jesus affected the identity of the people around him. And Jesus affected the way that they could connect with God. These are the most significant things that you could do in celebrating the presence of Jesus. And oh, he affected them greatly. How could he not? If you look at these passages here, Matthew chapter 5, Mark 2, Luke 8, John 6, you're going to see that in each of the Gospels, and these are just some of the passages, people were rallying around Jesus because he was affecting them. Uh, there were crowds that were, that were coming. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, this is Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And they must listen to his words because at the end of 7, he's speaking as one who had authority. And the, the words that he was speaking were so clearly true. This was a man of God. You can confirm it from the scriptures of the past. And as the things that he said must resonate deeply, looking for a transformation in our hearts and our minds and our actions for God. And crowds, crowds rallied to hear that. Mark chapter 2, the crowds were so big because of the healing, miraculous abilities of Jesus. Healing the broken bodies healing the broken spirits. The crowds had gathered so that you couldn't even get near the house uh, that he was visiting at that time. Luke chapter 8, if you want to look at there, that you can see that it gets a little more personal even. Jesus is fect affecting uh, individual people. It says, Now it came to pass afterward, he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Celebrate. And the twelve were with them. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, celebrate, and Joanna, the wife of Chudza, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance, celebrate. And when a great multitude had gathered, they're celebrating, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by parable in which he was teaching and lifting the people closer to God. And they were responding. John chapter 6, Jesus had been teaching, and they were hungry for his teaching, and so they followed after him. And, and Jesus gives this particular uh, message, and you know the one in which uh, Philip says they couldn't even feed these people if they had 200 denarii, and Jesus then gathers up what they have, the loaves and the fish, and he performs this incredible miracle and provides bread and fish and food for all the people that were there in such abundance that they took up the extra in 12 baskets. Now, some people got it. Oh, Jesus has real power. He doesn't have to look a certain way. He doesn't have to dress a particular way. He doesn't have to be affiliated with our current uh, governments and religious leaders. This is truly God. This is truly the Messiah. And he's above those things, and he's affecting the daily lives, the identity, and the connections to God. But there were still people who would murmur about it. Not everybody was on board. And this is a caution before we dive into the celebration part. The caution. You see these things taking place. It's fulfilling the prophecies. You can check that in scriptures. And even still, some of the religious leaders would murmur and complain and try to find fault. In Luke chapter 15, you have several that are going to do just that. He said all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. So you have these people who are caught up in sin or who would have been viewed as less than, and they are drawing close to him because of the transformative words that he has and the works that he's doing and the road he's showing them towards God and freedom. But the murmuring takes place because the Pharisees and the scribes, they complained, saying, this man, he receives sinners and he eats with them. So dismissive of the good works that Jesus is doing. They forgot to celebrate. That sort of attitude is having more in common with the history of Israel who uh, left God, forgot God, and turned to the other nations, turned their hearts in a direction away from God than towards them. Sure, they kept all the rules and the laws and they knew those, but they forgot a critical thing. And Jesus is going to help them. He's not beating them up here. He's not putting them down. He's giving them the blessing of a teaching. And he does it with three stories in Luke chapter 15. They would be the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And this is where the ears have to perk up a little bit because he's like, yeah, maybe I'm not celebrating like I should be with Jesus. And, and yeah, maybe sometimes I murmur about the works of the church. And yeah, maybe if I'm being honest, I'm not turned to God like I should be. 
Jesus is trying to get us in these passages to understand, not just at a human level, but at a divine level, the need for celebration and the things that we should be celebrating. Not to be apathetic about, not to let them coast, but the things that we should be putting as a priority. And he starts off with this amazing lesson that seems so simple. That's the genius of his teaching, uh, is that it, it's so easy to process here. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. It'd be easy to stop there. But a critical part of the story, in the, all these stories, in which there is something that is important, it is lost, it is recovered. Sometimes we stop there. That is not the point of what Jesus is getting here when you put all three of them together. It's this next section here. It is lost, it is recovered, but this final part. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. The celebration was to bring people together and to have this moment that what was lost is now found. And then he really emphasized it here when he says, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is celebrating. And if heaven is celebrating, then what will we do who know that we were the lost at one point? How can we not celebrate in the presence of Jesus? If you didn't get it the first time, the scribes and Pharisees, he goes on and gives a second example with the parable of the lost coin. And the lady loses the coin. She finds the coin. And when she finds it, she says, uh, she runs to her neighbors in verse 9 and says, Rejoice with me. I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, he says, emphasizing it, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And if they still didn't get it, he goes into the story of the lost son, and he goes in with great detail. And there was a son who had abundance, but he wanted his inheritance early, and he took it and he left, and he descended down into debauchery. He had a good life. He had the promise of many great things. But then he turned his heart to things that weren't so great. And he descended in his daily life. He descended in his identity. He descended with his connection with his father until he found himself eating the same as the pigs and being of the lowest sort. And he goes back to his father and he asked just to be a servant. But the, the father is so overwhelmed, he can't, he can't be more excited. And he takes the son back in and he hugs him. And he puts on uh, proper clothes to fit him. And he wants to celebrate this moment and having the calf killed. And we're going to have a party to celebrate this particular moment. Do you see how this might resonate with the Pharisees and scribes who have such a high value for their history? And Jesus is saying, yes, let me point out your history. You need to come to this recognition. You have that relationship with God, but in the history, Israel descended, didn't they? In their daily life, their identity and their connection with God, they turned their hearts away from the glories that they could have had by chasing after other than God, just like that son chased away uh, his inheritance and the relationship with his father, and he descended down into utter shame and brokenness. But how excited was God to have him back? And what the scribes and Pharisees were failing to see that this was Jesus right here. This was the Son of God, being the Messiah, being the Christ. He was the one that was putting their arms saying, I can take you back. I'm ready to fulfill and be your God and take you into the new covenant, which would come through Jesus. But to really extra emphasize it, he gave them the joy. He brings in the character of the other brother who didn't celebrate, but murmured. But he murmured. His heart wasn't in the right place. So Jesus gave this as a warning. But through all those stories was the joy and the excitement that comes from recovering that which is lost, the great value that God is putting on his people, you and me as well. So yeah, these were celebrations. Matthew 5, the crowd celebrating Jesus. Mark 2, celebrating Jesus. Luke 8, celebrating Jesus. John 6, absolutely celebrating Jesus. In the crowds, they were getting excited because of it. How could they not? Their daily life was truly affected, weren't they? 
We may not think of it this way because sometimes it's just a story, but if you think about the healings and the miracles that Jesus was accomplishing, how he was healing their broken physical bodies, how could this not affect their daily lives and give them reason to celebrate? He healed people of diseases that had no cures. He, he cast demons out of them of which we have no power. He healed the paralytics, the epilytics, uh, the blind, the deaf, those with withered hands, even the dead, and even those that were for far off that seemed too distant, not for Jesus. He could heal from even a distance. Now, we can read that as a story and go, that's a nice fact to process. But if we really commit to the understanding of what he's doing, he is transforming their lives daily lives. It may just be a withered hand, but when it's healed, you can garden again. You can hold someone again. You can open doors again in ways that you hadn't been able to do. You may have been uh, someone whose legs did not function. You were lame. They didn't have the facilities and the medical abilities that we have today or some of the considerations for people with disabilities. You would have probably been relegated to being a beggar, to being ignored, to being cast aside. But now with Jesus, Jesus heals and his legs could function again. And he couldn't, not just that he had to lay on the ground, he could now stand. And he wasn't just standing, he leaped. And he wasn't just leaping. This was a guy who had been healed by Jesus. His life, his daily life is going to shift immensely. And he runs out and he tells people about Jesus. Every single day this man's life would be affected. How could he not celebrate Jesus every single day? And the same for every person, the multitudes that Jesus would heal in the physical sense. How could it not affect their daily lives? They could draw closer to Jesus. In the same way, he would heal broken identities for people. Think about Matthew for just a second. I think what's so interesting about the story of Matthew, who would be a tax collector, as Mark pointed out, uh, he would have been the face of the Roman people. He would have been the people that would have been uh, collecting the taxes of his own uh, brethren, his own heritage. And sometimes they would elevate those taxes and he would put some extra in his pocket. People knew this. They would refer to the tax collectors in the same way they would of the harlots and the lowest people uh, in their culture. Matthew was a tax collector. Really and truly, what kind of social standing did he have? Really and truly, what was his identity? That wasn't great. I think what's really interesting is Matthew himself, in his own gospel, gives the calling of him to be an apostle and follow Jesus. It's really interesting that he puts it in a chapter, chapter 9, where he is surrounded by other healings. The way Jesus transforms the identity of Matthew is a different, deeper, heavier kind of healing. It's identity. It's not just how he sees himself, but who he can become when Jesus says, follow me. Well, yeah, Matthew gets up and follows him. He'd seen the healing. He'd heard the teaching. He'd known who Jesus is, the reality of who Jesus is. He's drawing closer in that understanding. And so when Jesus says, follow me, Matthew recognizes, I'm not a tax collector. I'm a follower of Jesus. I am, I'm following the rabbi. I'm following the Messiah. This is a different kind of identity for me. He's elevating. And it wouldn't be just Matthew. Think about Zacchaeus, another tax collector and what he did for him. Think about Mary Magdalene. We read that she had seven demons and Jesus cast them out. Think about all the people that were such low status from a societal standpoint. And truly for some of them from a religious standpoint, they were so low. But Jesus says, follow me. None of that's of significance. Follow me and be transformed. Repent of the things that you have sinned against, but follow me and let me change your identity of who you are. You are now people in Christ. You are now people in God. You're God's people. That's a different identity. You don't play by the world's rules on that. You're something more significant. How could they not celebrate that they had a new kind of identity? Most importantly, he also transformed, healed a broken connection with God. We know that comes because of sin. We know that. We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight uh, as we talk about hell and condemnation and those <laughs> not so fun topics, but they have to be talked about. We're going to talk about that tonight. But this broken connection, this broken relationship with God, the most critical thing possible, and Jesus is emphasizing his ability to do so 
Luke chapter 5. Let's turn over there to Luke chapter 5. We're going to that story in which the house was crowded so much you couldn't get in, and the friends were willing to uh, climb up on a roof, and they wanted to lower their paralytic buddy down so that he could be around Jesus, and maybe, just maybe, this uh, transformation could take place that Jesus would affect him, and Jesus would. He had the power to do so. He had the love to do so. And so now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and they let him down and his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. These are good friends. And when he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? This was the point of what Jesus was doing. He starts with the forgiving of sins because they need to know who he is and what he is actually capable of doing. When you can forgive sins, you are restoring, reconciling a connection back with God. More important than the paralysis that has affected this man. More important than the social considerations that people might give him for being a paralytic to begin with. You've got the connection with God when your sins are forgiven. This is what Jesus came to do. They were kind of freaking out as they're trying to understand this, and some would agree and some would murmur against it. And he says uh, down in verse 22, why are you so reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or say rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Jesus was given the evidence of a power they didn't have, could not have, could only come from God. And the celebration took place because immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, We have seen strange things today. Yeah, Jesus came and in his presence People's daily lives were changed. People's identity was changed. Their connection with God was changed. And there was reason to celebrate. Now, that challenges us, doesn't it? Because it's not like Jesus disappeared from reality. The presence of Jesus is real. We have it through the Word. We have it when we come together and we know He is not far from us. We know that when we pray, Jesus is there. Jesus is capable of hearing. God is capable of acting. So how do we celebrate Jesus in our lives? How do we make sure that our hearts aren't turned away from Jesus and we go from those moments when we have the possibility of the relationship and a covenant with God, we move away from that and are charmed by the world and charmed by sinfulness and become broken, shattered, and shameful? How do we avoid that mistake? Here's some suggestions really fast. Invite the presence of Jesus deeper into your life, your daily life, your daily life. Sometimes we get so caught up in the idea that there's only big things that are going on in life, and that's the only thing that God might care about. Um, I heard an example one time in which a person had rocks and a jar and sand, and they were trying to figure out how to get as much in as possible. Of course, their eyes went first to the rocks because they were bigger, big stones. And so they piled those in and said, there's no room for anything else. And then the teacher pointed out to them, well, if you put the big rocks in, you can pour the sand and it finds its way. The small things, the granule things, they belong in there as well. And they fill up the space and you can get it all taken care of. My point is in your daily life, God can take care of it all when we include his presence in it. We may think that we get in these normal things of feeding the dog or the cat taking out the trash, uh, waking up your family. And these are just meaning, these are just things you do and it's no big deal. But it is a big deal. If the presence of Jesus is included in that in a way that's celebrating, it's a context that you're thinking of it. Feeding a dog and a cat may not seem like the biggest thing in the world, but you are giving sustenance to something. And that is something that may draw your mind to the way God provides sustenance for us and we participate in that. 
The daily things that you do to wake up your family and take care of them is love and care and compassion. It may seem like a little thing if we let it become separate and the love isn't there, the care isn't there for lifting them up. But if we put the presence of God in our life, the presence of Jesus, and we celebrate that, we view that in a different context. Because yes, it's our daily life and we are mindful of it in its connection to Jesus. We're mindful of it because of our identity as Christians that we're doing this because of Jesus and we get to be Christians in Him. And we're also doing it in our connection to God because one of the great things that we saw in this last particular point here, the connection to God, is forgiveness is the highest, truest kind of healing that we could experience. And if forgiveness is the highest, truest kind of healing we can experience where our soul is healed and we are reconnected with God, how can I not be connected into God when I'm willing to extend that to the people around me? Is that always easy? No, it's not. But in your daily life, you'll find issues and problems that may come up in which people may become bitter and fight and push against one another. Ugh, it's ready to hold them grudges especially now in a time when there's so much stress and turmoil affecting our lives. But if you're connected with God, forgiveness. Give forgiveness. Give it generously. Give it graciously. Give it easily. Because that's what God does for us. And that's one way we can celebrate, by our willingness to forgive. We can celebrate because we remember constantly our identity as Christians in every act of our mundane life. Do not ever think it's too little, too small for Jesus. Pray about it. He can handle it. Pray about it. He wants to be a part of it. The way that you work, the way that you relate to one another, the way that you watch TV, the way that you go to the grocery store, these are things that connect to God. Don't ever forget that. Know your identity and stay connected with God. It's a beautiful thing to be able to celebrate Jesus. I don't want our hearts to ever be apathetic, to be carefree and separate. I don't want our hearts to ever be turned away. But we need to be people who celebrate Jesus. And the world needs to see how excited we are to be the people of Jesus. Let's do that in our daily lives, in our identity, and our connection with God. If there's a way that we can help you in that, let us know. Let us pray together. Let us study together. Let's be connected with God. If you need help, let us know as we stand and as we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. Please be seated. Just a few announcements before we dismiss, and uh, then I want to introduce someone to you in just a moment. Ladies class, remember your Zoom Bible class will be on Thursday, 6.30. Make sure you're a part of that. If you've got questions, contact Julie Ferguson. Uh, seniors, you have your Zoom Bible study on uh, Friday at 11 o'clock. If you have questions about that, please see me. Our teenagers, your devotional this week, Tuesday the uh, evening, 7 o'clock here at the church building. 
uh, parent. Uh, we'll be having those devotionals. I haven't got a sign-up sheet, but if you'd like to host those devotionals, please contact me and uh, we'll make sure that takes place. Don't forget the congregational meeting this afternoon, 445, that will be on Zoom. Uh, I sent information out about how to get on Zoom this last week. If you did not get that, I'm planning on resending that out this afternoon. If you don't get it, please contact me so you can be a part of that congregational meeting on Zoom. And then I want to remind all our young people, uh, grades kindergarten through 12th grade, your Zoom Bible class this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Again, if I'll be sending information on how to get on those Zoom meetings. Uh, we'll need to see you about one little note on that, so see me at the end of services. Uh, but everyone else, if you uh, 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 make sure if you get that note tonight on how this afternoon on how to be on those Zoom meetings at five o'clock. Five o'clock. Now, I made a statement earlier that when I sat down, I thought, man, that sounds like it was going to be a major announcement. Uh, we're not quite yet there, but we're in the process of looking for the individual that will be our our youth and family and fellowship minister. We have invited someone to come and be with us this weekend, and it has been a great weekend. Uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself. And the reason we're doing this, folks, is because of the virtual situation. Uh, last night, we had a group that came in and had uh, Josh uh, did a devotional, answered some questions, and then uh, we just played and had some good times with the kids last night and their parents. Uh, we also had a Zoom meeting so that folks that wanted to be a part of that could, could see the devotional, be a part of the devotional on Zoom and the questions and answers. And I'm sorry the computer died. If you were on that, my computer died before it completed, but you didn't miss too much, okay, just a little bit. Uh, the other thing is we thought there's so many people that would like to just get to know Josh and get to know him and his family and not only just here this morning, but on, on uh, live stream. So we've asked Josh to come forward to introduce himself. He is showing interest in us. We're showing interest in him. We want as an eldership to be open to you so that you know what we're doing and where we are in the process. So Josh, come on up here, introduce yourself to everybody. And then if you don't mind, Josh, close out our service this morning with a prayer, okay? Good morning, church. <clears throat> well, as he said, we uh, got here last night, I guess, to uh, kind of go through all the things, got to meet several of you uh, on the Zoom meeting. You know, I got to see a couple. As soon as I started leading singing, I saw people start dropping out of the Zoom meeting. I don't know if that was on purpose. Hurt my feelings a tad bit. Uh, as you can see, we had, uh, I wrote this down, just kind of that little PowerPoint slide um, for people at home. But uh, I preached in, um, let's see, it'd be Keys, Oklahoma, Elkhart, Kansas. Uh, I was splitting time between there for about five years. And while doing that, I was coaching uh, over in uh, Yarbrough, Oklahoma for the high school and the uh, junior high. And then uh, met Megan. And uh, that was a little bit different meeting. If you'd like to know more about that, uh, I told everybody last night, but you can meet with me afterwards on that. Um, I moved out to uh, Holiday, Tennessee. Things started happening pretty rapidly after that. We had our son, <clears throat> and this will be our, seven, or our fourth year there, moving our time ahead here. But uh, after that, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of just, uh, when we first started getting there and started to uh, meet people from the congregation and things like that, um, <clears throat> we noticed that there was a big need um, for the kids in that area. And so uh, I offered my services to uh, help coach the basketball team up there. And so that's what I've been doing there for the last three years. We've gotten to got a lot of kids and a lot of help for those kids around that area. But uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit different side of myself here, I guess, kind of what I, I look for in this type of position is uh, I want you to go to a verse with me. And I kind of want to explain the way I'm thinking on this thing here. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 12. <clears throat> My dad would always tell me, he would tell me all the time, I'd say, Dad, I'm going to be this preacher here. How do, I, how do I go about being a preacher at such a young age? Who wants to listen to such a, a young guy, you know, get up and preach? 
And he'd say, well, there's a time where people think to themselves that, oh, you don't want to listen to a young guy. And then there's a time where older people think, well, they don't want to hear what I have to say. There's nothing that I have to tell them. He said, so there's a small window there. He said, so what are you going to do? He said, I want to read you a verse here. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to bring to a position like this, to be an example to the kids, to be an example to members, to everyone around, to help us grow together. That's, I would say, probably my biggest thing is to create relationships, maybe with people who aren't used to being around each other, to get those people interacting with each other. My full name is Joshua. Everywhere I've been, I say my name's Joshua, and the first time I meet somebody, they say, it's good to meet you, Josh. So it doesn't last very long. If you call me Joshua, I'll probably think I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm very involved with a camp. My grandpa started about 56 years ago, 57 maybe. My dad was a director there for 25 years. My dad is also a preacher, and uh, he decided to get out of that, and so I decided to pick it up, and um, I've been doing that for... I think about five years. It's kind of hard to remember with the COVID year. But uh, I think right at five years, I've been directing this session of camp. It's a very small camp. And if that is something to where I do end up coming here, that's something I'd still like to be involved in. Very passionate about it. Very active. Love to go out and do things. We went and played some basketball in Foursquare last night. And I'm a little sore this morning. But, uh, you know, there's some, some things here that uh, I think would be very beneficial for, for both sides. But uh, I do love singing. I love to uh, be interacting with people all the time. And so that's just a little bit about uh, myself. And, um, you know, if you'd like to get to know uh, me and my family, Raiden and Megan, if you can catch Raiden, you know, maybe you can pin him down and talk to him. I don't know. But uh, normally you'll see Megan chasing him around everywhere. Uh, but that's really all I have for uh, introduction-wise. Uh, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and bow with me and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the many wonderful blessings that you provide for us in this life. Lord, we ask that you help us to all be lights and to uh, take what we learn here from today and to rejoice in the things and celebrate in the things that you provide for us. Lord, let us be those lights in a dark world that we live in today to, to show people that you do exist, to be those examples to people that we need to be examples to. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we dismiss from here and to uh, always be with us, to always give us courage, to always uh, give us the knowledge to help spread your gospel. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.